Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm here to talk about uh, the intersection of artificial intelligence and IP rights, which I call artificial rights. I'll, I'll tell you why it's, it's called artificial rights. So first, let's look at what is AI. AI is nothing but simulation of human intelligence. And how do we make that happen? Typically, machine logic works by way of a simple yes, no, right? And any complex computing function that you're talking about is a is millions and billions of yes and no functions being repeat all over and all over again. But that's not the way human logic works, right? Human logic works in a slightly different way. So we work on other logics. For instance, there could be a possibility of, you know, some answer being certainly yes, possibly yes, some could be cannot say, some could be possibly no, and some could be certainly no. For instance, just look at the picture. This is a picture of an elephant, and if I ask you this question, is this a picture of an elephant? Your answer will be certainly yes. But if I ask you this question, is it an African elephant or an Indian elephant? Then probably you will be moving along the lines of, you know, it's a possibly yes or a possibly no, right? But if I give you another input, let's say that this picture is taken in Africa or that this picture is in fact taken in India, you could probably just move from one of these spectrums and give it a slightly different answer depending on the other fields of information that is fed to you. This is how we process information and where all do we get this information from? We get it from uh, the taste, we get it from smell, we get it from listening, we get it from reading, we get it from watching movies, we get it from sensation, which is touch. We process all this information and then arrive at some sort of a probabilistic output to any question, right? So you can look at me and say that, okay, this is a man who is roughly around 5'7", standing in front of you and delivering a lecture. That's a probabilistic output because of all the learnings that you've done in the past. You know, taught by the teachers, taught by the parents, etc., etc. AI works in a very similar fashion. And how do they work? Based on large amounts of data that's fed to AI, AI is trained to actually give the best probabilistic output of a data that's fed to them. A simple example of how typically a Gen AI LLM model will work. So let's assume that a question is being asked to it or an input is being asked to it with respect to a word like queen, right? Standalone that word could signify many things, not just to an AI, even to your brain. It could remind you of the word England because of the fact that there is a queen in England. You could get reminded of the fact that there is crown and crown is something which is placed on the queen's head. It could also be a Netflix series as well. So Netflix is another association that you have with respect to that word. Similarly, you could think of the movie, which is a Bollywood movie. And when you think of that Bollywood movie, you could think of Kangana Ranat. When you think of Kangana Ranat, you could think about Ritik Roshan, you could think about Arnav Goswami, you could think about BJP, right? You could think of many things. So depending on various combinations of this word that's placed to you, similar to how your brain works, right? Uh, the LLM could give you an answer. If you say Queen's necklace, it could actually tell you Mumbai. If you say Queen of Jansi, it could give you a different answer, right? Or the freedom struggle that we had. So this is typically the way how we think, how LLM thinks. Now, how do we operate? After getting all this information that's been fed to us for over the years, we create content. We create movies. We create songs. We create novels. We create drawings, we create technology. And all the technology that we create is then granted an intellectual property right. And what is this picture doing there? This is just to denote that it was it first came during the Industrial Revolution era, right? Before that, no IP. It was the first time that we recognize that there's something known as intellectual property, and that needs to be protected and given a special status under law called intellectual property rights. Now, why do we protect IP or why do we give this IP? Multiple reasons. One is to promote innovation so that the Steve Jobs of the world could actually give you an iPhone, right? So that he's incentivized to come out his product, spread the knowledge, write books so that Herge's Tintin is available to you when you're young or you could read Archie's comics to promote innovation and promote more people to come out with innovation. Secondly, and this is something that we forget often, is to ensure access to also ensure that when you buy the copy of the book, uh, the author or the inventor is rewarded for it so that he's incentivized to ensure that the book is reaching you. 
or incentivize to ensure that the process of the technology is reaching you. So these are the two main functions why we protect IP and why IP is there in the first place. But the last part, which is the ensuring access part, is often forgotten when it comes to IP, when it comes to implementing IP. And that's why this battle of IP versus AI is going on in this world right now. And why do I call it as an artificial right? I'll tell you. I believe that not just IP, any property right in the world is an artificial right. For instance, if you just look at it, there's a picture of my apartment that I bought. Me and my wife has put in our hard-earned life saving into getting this apartment. But what is my property right in this apartment? Any property right in India is not absolute. It's only relative. So let's assume that I have a property right and you have a different property right. You could come and argue before a court to say that you have better property right over me by way of tax paid receipts, by way of other documents. The court will favor you and say that actually you have a better property right or title over me on that property. Now let's come back to the flat. Flat is not that, you know, uh, it's very difficult to establish this title conflict in a flat. But let's come to this flat. I own around 1872 square feet of, a pa of space in this particular apartment. But is my right absolute? No. My right is sandwiched between the right of everybody else who lives in that apartment. And there are flows above me, flows below me, flows on the side. So it's a sandwich right I have. I cannot change the corridor. I cannot change the colors of my balcony. I cannot change or make any changes to the, uh, the fixtures or make any sort of alterations to my fa for flat. Then how is it actually my property right? I mean, it's a sad thought, right? Despite sinking into all our life saving, we don't even have a full right over the property that we own. Next, let's move on to the car, right? I have a very lovely car. I love it. But I can only drive it for 10 years. After that, I lose the pollution certificate unless I renew it, right? Even after renewing it for another five years, it will be taken off the road. I don't fully own it. I can't own it forever and say that, look, this is my car. I cannot drive it a little longer. What is the case with the iPhone? The iPhone itself, if Apple kicks you out of the App Store for your misbehavior, for your lack of compliance with the App Store terms, then it's just a brick. If you decide not to update the iPhone after a certain point of time, it can turn a brick. If you jailbreak it as well, it could become a brick. So do you really own it after paying like over a lakh for an iPhone? This is not just the case with iPhone. It could be the case with any electronics that you find, any property that you item that you find, other than probably, for instance, uh, furniture, right? Uh, sometimes you could even say that even the termites and ants also have some right over the furniture compared to you as well. Moving on, where, how did we reach this point? We need to understand that world over, property rights has always originated from uh, the perspective of a person who reached there first. This was the case with respect to Wild Wild West, where there were vast lands available for you to conquer. You went there and placed your flag and ensured that you conquer that place, you earned a title over that piece of flag. Something like this, if you remember. If you went to school, and just like us, if you were to catch a particular seat in a school bus or a, or a, or a, or a train, you could put a hanky and say that, okay, I have reached here first and this is my flag over here. This is for me or my friend or my wife or whoever it is. IP rights are similar. The first person to invent, the first person to claim, the first person to file often get the IP right. But why do I say that IP rights are even more artificial than the other rights? Try copying my apartment. Try copying the exact contours of my apartment to another apartment. Trust me, you're not able to succeed. But with respect to IP rights, it's possible for two people on the planet Earth to come up with two different inventions, which are exactly at the same time. The case in point is Mr. Marconi and Jagdish Chandra Bose is on the picture. And there have been several in the past. Those who went to the finishing line of filing of a patent in the first place got the IP. The second one always left out. So are we really rewarding the inventors and, and innovators all the time? Maybe not. Secondly, it's capable of being copied with 100% accuracy. You can take a photo of the book. You can, you know, take a photo of a photo. It's all possible. So it's possible for IP rights to be completely reproduced or copied. But still, let's not forget this, IP is very valuable. If you look at this, this list, I mean, this doesn't have NVIDIA for the time being. The most valuable companies, except the few companies like Aramco, etc., who also have some large amounts of real estate, most companies, most valuable companies in the world are companies with most valuable IP. So it is valuable. There's no doubt about it. 
And in fact, it's some of these companies with IP who's also leading the journey with respect to AI that we are seeing currently. Now, another problem with IP is this particular mouse. This particular mouse entered public domain in 2024. So every copyright has a term. The term is around 60 years. So if the author is author is dead, then you know it's just 60 years plus the you know uh, when the author passed away is the term of the copyright. Now it's possible to tweak this rule, and trust me, I'm a lawyer on this. If you have one comic and you draw a Mickey Mouse, 70 people worked on drawing this Mickey Mouse. The 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 date of passing away of the last person is when the 60 years rule will start tweaking. Finally, after so much trouble, this Mickey Mouse entered the public domain. So that if your kid, if your brother, if your sister draws this, you won't be sued. But trust me, it's only this version of Mickey Mouse. There are other newer versions of Mickey Mouses, which are still under copyright, and you could be sued. And there have been instances where Disney has sued, you know, kindergartens and whatnot in America, and lobbied very hard to protect this Mickey Mouse. And this disclaimer itself is to ensure that I don't miscommunicate at all. And another instance where we have seen IP being terribly, terribly misused with respect to rent seeking is with respect to vaccines, right? When we fought the COVID, the Global South was denied access to very, very expensive intellectual property of vaccines because of the fact, despite the, vaccine, the fact that vaccines were publicly funded, we were denied of access to, access to this particular IP so that we can fight the vaccines, fight the COVID-19 uh, uh, pandemic. So these are the questions that we need to ask ourselves. How long should we let the innovator, the mouse, the pharma companies, rent seek? So IP should always have an expiry rate. IP should always have fair use, which means that kids can copy it, you can use it for education, and there should be compulsory public access. So if something is out of circulation, if something is not, somebody is not making the vaccine available to the public, it should be available to the public by way of some checks and balances. Despite all this, Currently, our IP laws allows certain permissions to us. A child can create a content in school, right? Uh, a mimic can mimic somebody. But if artificial intelligence starts doing it, we start becoming very upset. When AI creates arts, we start becoming very, very upset. And you could see the number of copyright suits and suits which are happening all over the world where various publications are suing various LLMs uh, various developers of LLMs with respect to matters relating to copyright. And this uh, is an image of somebody, uh, I think you might say this is Hrithik Roshan, but I actually asked uh, one LLM model to generate Jackie Shroff, and this is how he looks like. But fact of the matter is, Jackie Shroffs and Amitabh Bachchans and Anil Kapoor's of the world have gone and protected their personality rights so that they could ensure that tomorrow AI models cannot create different versions of them they don't have to, you know, but uh, they don't have to ensure that, you know, uh, the AI models can be used to create new movies, per se. So they've done that. And this is a very interesting topic because, you know, an AI model doesn't need to be paid the same amount of uh, salaries or the same kind of, you know, cost for caravans that the actors typically charge when they do a movie. But still, this is being stopped nowadays. And there's an interesting tweet which happened, a viral tweet, where this particular artist on Twitter said, that you know what the biggest problem with pushing all things AI is? Wrong direction. I want AI to do my laundry and dishes so that I can do art and writing, not AI to do my art and writing so that I can do my laundry and dishes. Very interesting point, right? Do you all agree with it? Hold that thought because it's a very elitist thought, right? The reason why I'm saying it's very elitist is because of the fact that we live in a country where the folks who do this make hell out of money. The folks who do the laundry and dishes do not. And they are the ones who suffer, so we don't mind AI replacing them, but we have a problem when AI replaces novelists, artists, lawyers, consultants. So hold that thought. And remind you back to 200 years when, or 300 years when the Industrial Revolution was happening. They were artisans, they were chefs, they were shoemakers. There were a large number of professions and artisans who got entirely replaced by factories and machines, and large number of processes and they became factory workers in the process. Still, we have some chefs. We still have a best-selling show called The Master Chef. We still have artisan shoemakers left in the world. There are some who are always remaining and making sure that they are 11 in this world, but this has also happened in the meantime. This is the disruption that happened, and the large number of working class that we see in the world are as a result of this disruption. 
So we are again okay with them being disrupted further and not being us, right? One profession I can tell you for sure has never been disrupted by industrial revolution is actually the lawyer's profession. And we have a lot of problem about it nowadays. And also remember that it was during this disruption was when IP was formed, right? IP was formed as a way to support this disruption. And in this process, we saw a lot of churn. We saw worker oppression, because factories came for the first place. Before that, there was no concept of workers per se other than serfs and you know those folks who serve in agriculture. Came labor rights. Working women came for the first time. And women's right also came for the first time. We have never seen that kind of profit before. We have never seen that kind of income disparity before. We saw a lot of pollution due to industrial revolution. We saw a lot of the green movement coming out of it. We saw colonization and decolonization. We saw dictatorship at the same time, you know, the spread of democracy with the adult franchise. We saw communism at the same time, we also saw globalization. It was a very difficult 200 to 300 years of change that we faced and went through. And probably, it's time for us to wait for another churn to happen as well, because there's going to be a disruption. And this disruption is not going to be long for laundry and dishes, it's also for our economies as well for lawyers, for technologists, for consultants, for scientists, for everyone. And in this term, there are a few interesting questions for us to ask. It could be universal basic income or endowments that we could be thinking about. It could be a right to compensation for the past content that has been created by the likes of New York Times and Disney and whatnot. It could be the right to use unstructured information by the AI companies as a fair use. It could be a completely new fair use which we have not seen before for data mining as an exception or as an allowance. It could be a breaking down of the existing data policies or AI policies. And I'm sure that nobody really likes some of these companies that these they've launched the LLM models anyways. So they're breaking down. It could be the creation of a new working class, which probably we all will probably belong to. We don't know. We don't have the answers to this right now. But one thing I'm sure, if you're going to let an artificial right which we created stop the advance of human civilization, stop the advance of technology, I don't think we're going to get the right and the probably the best probabilistic output that we should be expecting as human beings. And I am very sure the current IP won't be the AI. We'll be creating new artificial rights to welcome AI into our fold. Thank you very much. <laughs>